So we are here for another a story time. Sending out the invites is the best part of the first 10 seconds of the stream. Haha. <laughs> in. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, that was... <laughs> not expecting... Hey, buddy! <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Sabotaged. Great way to start. <laughs> oh dear. I should probably light this place up a little bit. That was that was more frightening than I ever expected a crab to be. Wow. <laughs> Let's be friends. Woosha. I saw that crab coming at me. Coming at me. Oh man, I'm getting quadruple timed over here. Okay. This on top of that. Jump back into the water. See how many crabs we can have a chat with. Keep an eye on the oxygen meter. And I think there are more. Perhaps not. Okay. Look at all those snails. Come on, you crab. He got me. He pinched me. Here, say hello 
for it is my duty to say hello in return. to make an axe out of one out of some ingots Well, I'm hoping that this map will have uh, some sort of dungeon crawling that we can do at some point. Seems to be few and far between these days. Lumber. To make even more god awful platforms. Haha, <laughs> I was right. Hey, buddy. That's funny. Okay. I should probably start looking for a rubber tree. Hello, E. Welcome in. I'm glad you're here. Truly and sincerely. I hope your day is going okay. But if it's not, I hope that I can help it improve a little bit. Makes me happy that you're happy to be here. And yes, in response to your comment with the word swamp, swamp. And lots of creatures of darkness. And I need less water and more land, please and thank you. Although the sludge pits that I see over here are far less uh, uh, enticing. I should head over there eventually. Why is the entire map a swamp? Well, you raise an excellent question. Um, I 
I don't have an answer. <laughs> but we do have a friend shambling and lumbering towards us. And now they're on fire. The silence was so loud. That sounds like a poem waiting to happen. I feel like the sky is going to break open. So, oh. was I right or was I right there? The sky cracked open just there. Okay, well, at least we can see now. Something tells me that we are not alone. <laughs> yes, the sky has cracked open. I still don't see any rubber trees anywhere. Wow. I love the frame loss when I break it, please. All right. Try to finish discussion posts while you listen, because that's your last thing to do. Okay. Well, that sounds wondrous. Best of luck to you. I hope that you can get things done in a way and in a manner that uh, pleases you. And I will continue along my merry way to keep the noise in your background filled with the wonderful tones of that one story guy. <laughs> direction. That way we can find our way safely both to and from the sludge. so that shouldn't hurt me. Torch. deliberate process of building terrible water bridges. it all the way across without inviting or invoking the wrath of these little sludge monsters. I really should have bought a sh brought a shovel. Let's see, we'll be starting in about 14 minutes with some story time. Oh, hey, there he is already. Hey, buddy. Let's try to have a civil conversation, please. Swamp. Got me. You got me good. Okay. And I think we're done here until I get rubber boots because this is all mud. And as fun as it is, 
to trudge through mud. It isn't fun when everything else suddenly becomes three times as fast as you are. Who else will show up tonight? And the fog is closing in. Dig out another tree, he thinks. left till story time. I'm pretty excited. Ooh, that fog is really setting in. A cinder, hello. Food sounds wonderful. Welcome on in. I look forward to hearing from you. Do tell when you have finished dealing with the food. Sounds wonderful. I had chicken tikka masala 
this fine evening. And I do declare it was wonderful. Also, we're getting close to the end of uh, the Brothers Grimm, so I might start looking for suggestions. Potentially on a first come, first serve basis. Also, trying to look into making it a like a donation type of thing. I don't know yet. It was delicious. Chicken tikka masala is one of my go-to comfort foods. Truly and dearly. Okay, well we've hollowed out the upper portion of this tree. Perhaps we'll use it later. make myself a shovel. We've got seven minutes until story time. I'm going to use that shovel to get some silt. I'm going to turn that silt into silt glass. It's going to be wonderful. Allow me to tell you shovel this side of the between lands. Okay, onward to the silt. Fog is receding. Wonderful. Okay. We've allowed ourselves a level of silt can all agree upon as being satisfactory. At least a stack, which means we can split that. 32. There's four sulfur for each furnace. Okay. making at its finest. Four minutes until story time. What wonderful news. Oh, maybe I can make a bag now. Two, three, four, five. Yes, I can. Okay. Added nine inventory slots. How lovely. Potato waffles, chicken nuggies, and honey mayo. Sign me up. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Put 
this wonderful glass to use here. Doink. Okay. I'm so excited. We will soon be able to make little lanterns instead of having these terrible torches. Storage for tiny sludge worms. Using a weed wood fishing rod on the jar adds a worm to the rod. Interesting. I've never seen one of those before. And silk glass panes make a silk glass lantern. Okay. Planks and slabs. Making slabs, my dudes. Okay. Not the best, but it's cheap and it's food. I mean, potato waffles sound pretty okay. And chicken nuggets and honey mayo. It's like, it's like the perfect savory. Like, that sounds like the best comfort food right beside what I had, which was chicken tikka masala. Ooh, the hour is turning. We have 40 seconds until story time. So I'm going to go ahead and see if we can find a spot. this little guy hiding behind a tree. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Move your bear. Okay. How about this lovely serpentine, serpentine tree trunk? This looks lovely. Ooh. And what's this? Wonderful bogs. A marsh for us all. Okay. We're going to stick around right here while we do the story. And let's see where we're at. We are we, we have this much left. We're almost done. We're almost done with our brother's grim. We'll, we'll see how things go. We are now on chapter 38. And the title is Hans My Hedgehog. That sounds that sounds almost Shakespearean. Hans my hedgehog. My hedgehog, my hedgehog. <laughs> well, we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. And see what this Hans my Hedgehog is all about. And if I have to say that like ten times per page, I don't even know if I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Oh, congratulations, E! I'm very proud of you. You did great. You should share me share share me with share with share with me uh, the content. Should it should it please you to do so? You're very welcome. And away we go with Hans my Hedgehog. Once there was a farmer who had all the money and land he wanted, but despite his wealth there was one thing missing from his life. He and his wife had never had any children. When he met other farmers in a town or at the market, they would often make fun of him and ask why he and his wife had never managed to do what their cattle did regularly. 
1931 Frankenstein and comparing it to Mary's novel. Oh, okay. Compare and contrast. They would often make fun of him and asked why he and his wife had never managed to do what their cattle did regularly. <laughs> Didn't they know how to do it? In the end, he lost his temper, and when he got back home, he swore and said, I will have a child, even if it's a hedgehog. Yeah, that is pretty cold. Not long afterwards, his wife did have a child, a boy, as they could see from his bottom half. The top half, though, was a hedgehog. When she saw him, she was horrified. See what you've done, she cried. This is all your fault. It can't be helped, said the farmer. We're stuck with him. He'll have to be baptized like a normal boy, but I don't know who we can ask to be godfather. I would have a hedgehog child, perhaps. And the only name we can give him, she said, is Hans, my hedgehog. When he was baptized, the priest said, I don't know what you'll do for a bed. He can't sleep on a normal mattress. He'd jab holes all over it. Alas. The farmer and his wife saw the truth of that and put some straw down behind the stove and laid him there. His mother couldn't suckle him. She tried, but it was too painful altogether. The little creature lay behind the stove for eight years, and his father grew sick to death of him. I wish he'd kick the bucket, he thought. But Hans, my hedgehog, didn't die. He just lay there. I know. <laughs> wow. Holes in the mattress. <laughs> What a terrible thing. Prefer a normal hedgehog over a hedgehog human. You know, you're not wrong. <laughs> One day there happened to be a fair in the town, and the farmer wanted to go. He asked his wife what she'd like him to bring back for her. A bit of steak and a half dozen rolls, she said. Then he asked the maidservant, and, asked, and she asked for a pair of slippers and some fancy stockings. Finally, he said to his son, Well, what would you like? Papa, said Hans my hedgehog, I'd like some bagpipes. When the farmer came back, he gave his wife the steak and the rolls, he gave the maid the slippers and stockings, and finally he went behind the stove and gave Hans my hedgehog his bagpipes. Then Hans my hedgehog said, Papa, Go to the blacksmith's and have him make some shoes for the cockerel. Once you've done that, I'll ride away and never come back. The farmer was happy to get rid of him, so he took the cockerel to the blacksmith's and had him shod. Once that was done, Hans my hedgehog jumped on the cockerel's back and rode away, taking some pigs with him to tend in the forest. What if he punctures the bagpipes? Well, at least it's not the mattress. <laughs> When they were in the forest, he spurred the cockerel up, and it flew high into a tree with him. There he sat, keeping an eye on his pigs, and learning how to play the bagpipes. Years went by, and his father had no idea where he was, but the herd grew bigger and bigger, and he played more and more skillfully. In fact, music he made was... the music he made was quite beautiful. <laughs> You're not wrong, Cinder. One day a king came riding past. He had lost his way in the forest, and he was amazed to hear such lovely music, so he stopped to listen to it. He had no idea where it was coming from, so he sent a servant to find the musician. The servant looked around and finally came back to the king. There's a strange little animal sitting up in that tree, your majesty. It looks like a cockerel with a hedgehog sitting on it, and the hedgehog's playing the bagpipes. Well, go and ask it the, w the way, said the king. The servant went and called up into the tree, and Hans, my hedgehog, stopped playing and climbed down to the ground. He bowed to the king and said, What can I do for you, your majesty? You can tell me the way to my kingdom. I'm lost. With pleasure, your majesty. I'll tell you the way if you promise in writing to give me the first thing that greets you when you arrive home. The king looked at him and thought, That's easy enough to promise. This monster won't be able to read, so I can write anything. 
So he took pen and ink and wrote a few words on a piece of paper. Hans, my hedgehog, took it and showed him the way, and the king set off and was soon home again. Um, I don't remember, E. <laughs> now the king had a daughter, and when she saw com him coming back, she was overjoyed and ran down to greet him and kiss him. She was the first person he met on the way in, and of course the king thought about Hans my hedgehog, and told his daughter how he had nearly had to promise her to a strange animal that sat on a cockerel and played the bagpipes. But don't you worry, my dear, he said. I wrote something quite different. That hedgehog creature won't be able to read. That's a good thing, because I wouldn't have gone with him anyway, said the princess. Meanwhile, Hans my hedgehog stayed in the forest enjoying himself, tending his pigs and playing his bagpipes. The forest happened to be very large, and not long afterwards another king came by with all his servants and messengers, and he too was lost. Like the first king, he heard the beautiful music, and sent a messenger to find out where it was coming from. The messenger saw Hans my hedgehog up in the tree playing the bagpipes, and called up to ask what he was doing. I'm keeping an eye on my pigs, Hans my hedgehog called down. What do you want? The messenger explained, and Hans my hedgehog came down and told the old king that he'd tell him the way in exchange for a promise, and it was the same promise as before. The king must give him the first creature that greeted him when he got home. The king agreed and signed a paper saying so. Once that was done, Hans my hedgehog rode ahead on the cockerel to show them the way to the edge of the forest, where he said goodbye to the king and went back to his pigs. And so the king came home safely to the joy of all his courtiers. This king, too, had an only daughter who was very beautiful, and she was the first to run out and welcome her beloved father. She threw her arms around him and kissed him and asked him where he'd been and why he'd taken so long. We lost our way, my love, he said, but in the depths of the forest we came upon the strangest thing, a half-hedgehog, half-boy, sitting on a cockerel and playing the bagpipes, playing them remarkably well, too. He showed us the way, you see, and, well, my dear, I had to promise to give him whomever came out to greet me first. Oh, my darling, I'm so terribly sorry. But the princess loved her father and said that she wouldn't make him break his promise. She would go with Hans my Hedgehog whenever he came for her. Meanwhile, back in the forest, Hans my Hedgehog looked after his pigs, and those pigs had more pigs, and then those pigs had more pigs, until there were so many that the forest was full of pigs from one end to the other. At that point, Hans my Hedgehog decided that he spent all the time he wanted to in the forest. He sent a message to his father, saying that they should empty all the pigsties in the village, because he was coming with such a large herd of pigs that anyone who wanted some pork or bacon could join in and help themselves. His father was a bit put out to hear this. He thought Hans my Hedgehog was dead and gone. But then along came his son driving all those pigs in front of him, and the village had such a slaughter that they could hear the noise two miles away. What a wonderful and joyous sound. When it was all over, Hans my Hedgehog said, Papa, my cockerel needs new shoes. If you take him to the blacksmith and have him shod again, I'll ride away and never come back as long as I live. So the farmer did that, and was relieved to think that he'd, the b he'd seen the back of Hans my Hedgehog at last. When the cockerel was ready, Hans my Hedgehog jumped on his back and rode away. He rode and rode till he came to the kingdom of the first king, the king of the broken promise. The king had given strict orders that if anyone approached the palace playing the bagpipes and riding on a cockerel, they should be shot, stabbed, bombed, knocked down, blown up, and strangled, anything to prevent them from entering. So when Hans my Hedgehog appeared, the brigade of guards was ordered out to charge at him with their bayonets. But he was too quick for them. He spurred the cockerel up into the air and flew right over the top of the soldiers, over the palace wall, and up to the king's window. I know, right, E? My goodness. He perched there on the sill and shouted out that he'd come for what he'd been promised, and that if the king tried to weasel out of it, he'd pay for it with his life, and so would the princess. The king told his daughter that she'd better do what Hans my Hedgehog wanted. 
She put on a white dress, and the king hastily ordered a carriage with six fine horses to be made ready, and piled gold and silver and the deeds to several fine farms and forests into it, and ordered two dozen of his best servants to go with it. The horses were harnessed, the servants were all lined up, the princess climbed in, and then Hans, my hedgehog, took his place beside her with the cockerel on his knee and the bagpipes on his lap. They said goodbye, and off they went. The king thought he'd never see his daughter again. He was wrong about that, though. As soon as they were out of the city, Hans, my hedgehog, ordered the princess out of the carriage and told the servants to take several paces backwards and look the other way. Then he tore the princess's white dress into shreds and stuck her all over with his prickles until she was covered in blood. That's what you get for trying to deceive me, he said. Now clear off, go home, you're no good to me and I don't want you. There's a reason when I upload these to YouTube I mark not for children. <laughs> this is one of those reasons. <laughs> and she went home with the servants and the gold and the carriage and all, disgraced. So much for her. As for Hans my hedgehog, he took his bagpipes and jumped on the cockerel and rode away to the second kingdom, whose king had behaved very differently from the first one. He had given orders that if anyone arrived in the kingdom looking like a hedgehog and riding a cockerel, he should be saluted, given a cavalry escort, greeted with crowds cheering and waving flags, and brought with honor to the royal palace. The king had told his daughter what Hans my hedgehog looked like, of course, but when she saw sh him she was shocked all the same. However, there was nothing to do about it. Her father had given his word, and she had given hers. She bade ha Hans my hedgehog welcome with all her heart, and they were married at once and sat next to each other at the banquet. And then it was time to go to bed. He could see she was afraid of his prickles. You mustn't be frightened, he said. I'd do anything rather than hurt you. He told the old king to have a large fire made in the fireplace on the landing, and to have four men ready outside the bedroom door. I'm going to take off my hedgehog skin as soon as I go into the bedroom, he explained. The men must seize it at once and throw it into the fire and stay there till it's all burnt to ash. When the clock struck eleven, Hans my hedgehog went into the bedroom, took off his skin, and laid it down by the bed. Immediately the four men rushed in, seized the prickly skin, flung it on the fire, and stood around watching till it had all burned up. And the moment the last prickle was consumed by the last flame, Hans was free. Yeah, that's the, that's the face I'm making <laughs> right now. He lay down on the bed like a human being at last. However, he was scorched and charred all over as if he himself had been in the fire. The king sent at once for the royal physician, who cleaned him up and tended to his skin with special balms and ointments, and soon he looked like an ordinary young man, though more handsome than most. The princess was overjoyed. Next morning they both rose from the royal bed full of happiness, and when they had eaten breakfast they celebrated their wedding again, and in time Hans my hedgehog succeeded the old king and inherited the kingdom. Some years later he took his wife all the way back to see his father. Of course the old farmer had no idea who he was. I'm your son, said Hans my hedgehog. Oh, no, no, that can't be right, said the farmer. I did have a son, but he was like a hedgehog, all covered in prickles, and he went off to see the world a long time ago. But Hans said that he was the one, and told so many details about his life that the farmer was finally convinced, and the old man wept for joy, and returned with his son to his kingdom. I have so many questions. So many questions. My gosh. Wow. Okay. Well, anyway, here's uh, here's the next story, uh, chapter 39, entitled The Little Shroud. And it is one page long. Here we go. There was once a little boy, seven years old, so sweet and beautiful that no one could look at him without loving him. And as for his mother, she loved him more than anything else in the world. One day, without any warning, he fell ill and died. Nothing could console his mother, and she wept day and night. 
Soon afterwards, not long after he was buried, the child began to appear every night in the places where he used to sit and play when he was alive. If his mother cried, he cried as well, and when morning came, he disappeared. Uh, honestly, I don't think he had a clue about being treated poorly during his childhood. Like, the, the story... It, it, yeah, I have so many questions, but anyway... <laughs> If his mother cried, he cried as well, and when morning came, he disappeared. But his mother would not stop crying, and one night the child appeared in the white shroud in which he'd been buried, and with the little wealth, with the little wreath on his head that had been placed in the coffin with him. He sat on her bed and said, Oh, mother, please stop crying, or else I won't be able to fall asleep. My shroud's all wet from the tears you keep dropping on it. That startled the mother, and she stopped crying. Next night, the child came to her bed again, holding a little light in his hand. He said, See, my shroud's nearly dry now. I'll be able to rest in my grave. His mother offered her grief to God, and bore it patiently and quietly, and the child never came again, but slept in his little bed under the earth. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Don't cry for your dead beloveds, because they won't be able to sleep under the earth if you do. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. All right. Uh, I've got one more story. It's a short one, but it's it's the one I'm going to end on. Um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the first story that uh, <laughs> that we <laughs> endured. Uh, this is chapter 40, The Stolen Pennies. Once a father and his wife and their children were sitting around the table for their midday meal and a good friend of the family, who had come to visit, was sitting with them. While they were sitting there, the clock struck twelve, and just then a visitor saw the door. And just then the visitor saw the door open, and a deathly pale child, dressed in snow-white clothes, come into the room. He didn't look around or say a word, but went straight into the next room. A few moments later he came out, still saying nothing, and went out of the door again. Next day and the next, the child came back in the same way. Finally, the visitor asked the father who this beautiful child was, who had come in and went into the next room at noon every day. I didn't see him, said the father. I've got no idea who he can be. I'm going to get back to that sentence in a little bit. Next day, when the child came again, the visitor pointed him out. But neither father nor mother nor the other children could see a thing. The visitor got up and went to the door of the next room and opened it a little way. There he saw the child sitting on the floor probing the cracks between the floorboards with his fingers, but as soon as he saw the visitor, he disappeared. The visitor told the family what he'd seen and described the child exactly. The mother recognized him at once and said, Oh, it's my dear son who died four weeks ago. They lifted the floorboards and found two pennies that the mother had given the child to give to a poor man. However, the child had thought, I can buy myself a cake with that, and hidden the pennies under the floor. That was why he had no peace in his grave, and came every day at noon to look for them. The parents gave the money to a poor man, and after that the child was never seen again. Well, I guess we are getting closer to uh, October. Wow! <laughs> Yikes! Whoa! Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about that story that really stuck out to me was the part where he said, I didn't see him, said the father. I've got no idea who he can be. Like, it, when it comes to storytelling and what you assume, like what someone might assume, like, like, there's, there's a person, like, walking around in our house. And the father in the house, instead of saying, what are you talking about? Like, I don't, I don't know, like, 
like, you telling me you're seeing ghosts or what? Instead of saying that, he's like, I didn't see him, so I don't know who he is. What? <laughs> oh, man. Oh. I don't think your your apartment is haunted, so I hope that's somewhat comforting. But wow, that story, as short as it was, it's like one of those, who? <laughs> but can we talk about the, uh, can we talk about the Hans my Hedgehog for just a gosh darn second? What on earth? Where, what, how? Yeah. The guy, you'll have to, you'll have to, you'll have to enlighten me on that in a little while. First of all, shoving your child behind a stove for like what? Was it like seven or eight years? And that just becoming normal? What, what? Like, first of all, like, like, imagine. <sighs> you, some people don't have to imagine. That's unfortunate. But like, just like being pushed out because you weren't what, 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 what was expected. It's just like there are so many deep issues <laughs> with that. Um, and then, like, like, making a big fuss. Yeah. Making a big fuss about, like, oh, he'll put holes in the mattress. Like, so have a mattress that has holes in it. Like, anyway. But then, when he's, like, when the king was, like, stab him, shoot him, throw, like, shoot the cannons at him trample him I'm just like wow okay <laughs> a bit much <laughs> yeah 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 totally agree but then after that where he he he's like oh yeah I was tricked so I'm going to denude the princess and then fill her with my spikes and sent her home disgraced bleeding like, come on, dude. Have a heart or something. I know, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, basically. There's a, there's a lot going on in that story, and I'm just, like, sitting here going, I'm reading this. I'm, I'm starting it, and I'm finishing it, and <laughs> we're done. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was some interesting content tonight. Uh, looking forward to all the more at another time somewhere in the future. But I um, think I'm going to end it there. Cinder, E, anyone else who's listening but not commenting, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, and I hope that uh, it's it's helped bring some grounding of its own sort. Love, 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 love. And uh, I'm going to head out. You're very welcome. You're very, very welcome. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, as the rain fades from the Vidya game, I too shall fade. And we'll see you another time. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> Bye.